Good afternoon, everyone. Can I welcome you along once again to Glenwary Presbyterian Church on Sunday, the 5th of July, 2020, as we join together in our own homes to worship the God of all wisdom. Whether you're joining with us from the local area or from further afield, be that nationally or internationally, can I bid you a warm welcome in the name of the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I especially thank uh, Mrs. Grace Smith for uh, her ministry and song to us this morning. And can I also thank Catherine Orr, who has did our Faith Connection slot earlier on. If you haven't watched that after the service, feel free to do so. I'm sure that will be very helpful for you all. Uh, Catherine has asked me to announce that during the summer months of July and August, the Faith Connection slots will continue. So if you have children or grandchildren, I would encourage you to continue to tune in to those slots. Just an announcement, an important announcement here with regards to the resumption of church services in our church building. I'm sure you're all aware that as of today, it is now legal to have services in the church buildings. However, at a meeting of our Kirk session on Monday evening past, our church leadership decided that Sunday the 6th of September 2020 would be the provisional date for resuming services here in our building in Glenwary Presbyterian Church. That's Sunday the 6th of September 2020 at 12 noon. I know many people from our own congregation and I know certainly that includes your minister is longing for the day whenever we can return to corporate worship together. And in order to do that over the summer months a task group has been set up to make preparations so that we can return to worship in a safe way adhering to the current government guidelines with regards to that. Can I ask you to pray for them? Pray for us and in the meantime I trust you will all continue to avail of the online services during the months of July and August. There will be further details to follow probably mid-August about how we're going to resume worship in this building. Next Sunday morning at 11.30am the service will be uploaded to your Facebook page and YouTube channel. I want to read from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 19 to 23, as we're called to worship. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 19 to 23. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding he established the heavens. By his knowledge the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down the dew. My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, and they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Then you will walk on your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. Amen. Today's theme, as we continue our series in the book of Ecclesiastes, is the call to walk in the way of wisdom. Let's just pray as we seek the only wise God. Eternal God, we bow in your presence today. We bow to worship the God who is spirit, infinite, eternal and unchanging in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness and truth. We bow to worship the God who by his wisdom founded the earth and all therein. We thank you that you are the sovereign God who is in control over all the seasons of time. We thank you indeed that, Lord, even as we travel through difficult times uh, through this COVID-19 pandemic, that you are still on the throne and you're still remembering your own. And we thank you that by your grace you're beginning to open up avenues whereby believers can meet together to worship. And as we look forward, Lord God, to, to the resumption of services at the beginning of September, we pray indeed that the only wise God would continue to grant wisdom that we might seek the way forward to that end. We bless you that you are a good God. We bless you, Lord, that you are fulfilling your purposes for your people, even through the, the difficult situations that we find ourselves in. And Father, we thank you indeed that your word tells us that anyone who lacks wisdom, he, he just needs to ask you and you will grant it to him. And we do that at the very outset of our service today. We pray indeed that by your wisdom, by your spirit, you will come and you will minister to us according to your needs. Father, also at the beginning of this service, we confess our sinful condition. We confess that at times we have lacked wisdom in the past. 
We have tried to, in a sense, go our own way in rebellion against your will and your way for our life. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us for such times. We thank you for Jesus Christ, uh, the wisdom of God, the one who left the realms of glory to die on the cross of Calvary for sinners such as us. And Father, we pray today as we come to worship you, if there is any listening who do not yet know Christ as Saviour and Lord, we pray indeed that by your Spirit you would draw such people to yourself. Father, forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us afresh in that blood that was shed for us on the cross of Calvary, that we might worship you wisely in spirit and in truth. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace Smith is going to sing a piece entitled Grace. The words will appear on your screens at home. Feel free to, to sing along if you wish. Your grace that leads the sinner home from death to life forever and sings a song of righteousness by blood and not by merit. Your grace that reaches far and wide to every tribe and nation has called my heart to enter Without a stain Was traded for this sinner By grace I am redeemed By grace I am restored And now I freely walk Into the arms of Christ Praise rise up and overflow my song resign forever for grace will see me welcomed home to walk beside my Savior by from Ecclesiastes chapter 8. If you have not got your Bibles with you, again, as I say most weeks, just press pause and get your Bible, come back and then restart the video. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, beginning at the first verse. Let us hear God's word. Who is like the wise, and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his heart or his face is changed. I say keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, what are you doing? 
Whoever keeps the command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. For he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun, when man had power over man to his hurt. Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place, and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear before God. There is a vanity that takes place on the earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. And I commend joy. For man has no good thing under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, how neither day nor night do one eye see sleep, then I saw all the work of man, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. Amen. And we trust the Lord will bless the reading of his word to our heart here today. Let's just pray. Father, God of all wisdom, again, we bow humbly before you and we acknowledge that we need your help. We need your Holy Spirit to come to meet us at our point of need. Father, we pray today for our government. We pray, Lord, for those who rule over us, that you would grant them wisdom. And Father, those who lack wisdom, Indeed, that you would deal with them in justice. We pray, Heavenly Father, in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, as things begin to, to, to ease, we, we pray indeed for a vaccine to be found to combat, combat that virus. That in the months that lie ahead, there may be a greater degree of safety in all that we do. And Lord, specifically, we pray for members in our congregation here in Glenwary Presbyterian Church, who are currently in hospital, who have been going through treatment or have had surgery. We pray for those who are in nursing homes, for those who are recovering at home. We ask indeed that by your grace you would minister to each one of them. And now as we come to open up the word that we've just read and explained, we ask for an outpouring of your spirit upon both the preacher and those who listen at home. Indeed, that you would use your truth and grant us your wisdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sure you all know people who lack wisdom, or at least who fail to use wisdom. I think of the football manager who protests over vociferously at a referee's decision, and he ends up being banished to the stands. I think of the driver who is stopped by a policeman for speeding. He starts yelling and protesting. He threatens the police officer and he ends up in a prison cell. I think of the employee who loses his cool with his boss and he subsequently is dismissed from his job. The reality is, friends, that many of us have acted without wisdom in the past and have ended up paying the consequences. This morning's passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 calls us to walk in the way of wisdom. In this chapter, the preacher Solomon underlines to us the way of wisdom. He again notes that wisdom will help us survive in a dangerous world, dear friends. 
He also underlines once again, and in a sense in red pen, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of true wisdom. You see, we find wise principles this morning in this text to follow as to how we are to interact with people in positions of authority. But the preacher once again makes it clear here that there are limitations to human wisdom. No human being can ever fully fathom the mind or the ways of God. And therefore, in order to be wise, we must submit humbly to Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God. We must seek Christ's kingdom and his wisdom if we are to walk in the way of wisdom. Our sermon title this morning is A Call, Walk in the Way of Wisdom. Oh, I trust, dear friends, that God, the Holy Spirit, will grant you his wisdom, not only to be hearers of wisdom, but to apply it by faith to your heart. Three things we're going to note from this morning's text. Note firstly in, in verse 1 through to verse 9, the preacher instructs us about how to use wisdom in dealing with authorities. Secondly, in verses 10 through to verse 15, we are taught about how true biblical wisdom alone ensures eternal prosperity. And thirdly, the preacher concludes by alerting us to the limitations of human wisdom. Verses 16 to 20. The preacher has been searching for a wise man or a wise woman in the previous chapter. We have seen there in chapter 7 and in verse 28 that he finds this extremely futile. And now in chapter 8 he begins with two rhetorical questions. He asks in verse 1, who is like the wise? And who knows the interpretation of things? We might be tempted to jump to the conclusion that the answer to both of those rhetorical questions is no. There is no one wise. But the second half of verse 1 is very positive. Solomon goes on to say there that a man's wisdom makes his face shine and the hardness of his face is changed. So why would he say this if no one is wise? There must be some wise people in the world. Perhaps he is thinking here of wise men in the Old Testament such as Joseph and Daniel who both possessed the ability to interpret dreams. Certainly we read in chapter 1 of Daniel in verse 15 that, that Daniel's wisdom made his face shine. I think what Solomon is doing here at the beginning of this chapter is that while he concedes that we will never fully understand the, the ways of God, it is possible for human beings to walk in the wisdom of God. It is possible for human beings to walk in the wisdom of God. You see, biblical wisdom transfer, transforms all who seek to live according to it. Biblical wisdom, we read here in this opening verse, even has an impact on how a person's face looks. I wonder, dear friends, have you ever looked at the appearance of joy on the face of a wise old believer? I know I have, and at times I've been greatly encouraged by that. This is what Solomon is alluding to here. The wisdom of God in the face of a believer can make his face shine. It can give us a radiant outward demeanor, regardless as to what trials are going on in our lives. So having told us what wisdom looks like, note firstly his instruction here about how we ought to use wisdom in dealing with authorities. How we ought to use wisdom in dealing with authorities. Of course, in the original context, uh, these verses, verses 2 to 9, would have applied most specifically to life at the royal court, like the palace where, where Daniel served and in Babylon. But the principles we find here can be applied to any form of government or even more generally to any situation where we are called to submit to God-given authority. The preacher writes here firstly about the place of obedience and respect for authority. Verses 2 to 4. The place for obedience and respect for authority. Verses 2 to 4. You see, you and I can honour God, Christian friends, when we honour the king and those in authority over us. Our first duty towards authority is that of obedience. Look at verse 2. There we are charged to keep the king's 
command. Of course, whenever Jesus Christ was quizzed about paying taxes, taxes to, to, to the authorities, you remember what he said? In Mark chapter 12 and verse 17, he said, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And the Apostle Paul, Paul writes at length about the place of obedience to authorities in Romans chapter 3 verses 1 to 7. Whilst the Apostle Peter also commands us concerning that way in 1 Peter 2 verses 13 to 17. The place of obedience for authority. But why should Christians obey those in authority? Whether they be the king or the queen or the government or, or church leaders. Well, in verse 2 here, we're told, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. In fact, in the New Testament, in Romans, in, and in chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, Paul, I believe, explains this very helpfully. Paul there in Romans 13, and verse 1 and 2, says that, that we should let every person be subject to the governing authorities. He adds, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Friends, our submission to authority on earth is an important part of our submission to Christ. We're called to obey and to respect authority. And perhaps in light of the conduct of certain politicians in our own land this week on Tuesday past, in failing to, to, to follow government guidelines with regards to funerals, maybe you're thinking, why should I obey such people more? If that's the case, I fully understand. There is no doubt that the first, sorry, that the deputy first minister and others did not walk in the way of wisdom on Tuesday past. But this doesn't mean, friends, that we should follow their foolish example. Those who fail to submit to authority, the wicked, will eventually reap what they sow. Solomon goes on to write about this later on in verse 13. But if you know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I, we are commanded to obey the authorities and the regulations that have been put in place. And that includes these recent regulations with regards to how we can curtail the spread of COVID-19. Can I appeal to you as your minister? Do not do as some people do. Do instead what they say we ought to do. Walk in the way of wisdom as we seek to navigate a way through and out of COVID-19. Sometimes people wonder whether obedience to authority has any limits. Must we always submit to the government authorities? Or are there times whenever a Christian does not have to obey? Well, the answer to that question is very simple. In the New Testament, in Acts chapter 5, whenever Peter was commanded by the authorities of his day to stop preaching the gospel, how did he respond? Well, in Acts 5 and verse 29, he said, We must obey God rather than men. We must obey God rather than men. And this provides us with an excellent biblical principle. When there's a conflict between God and man, friends, we have a higher authority if we know the Lord. We must obey the Lord and seek to walk in the way of his wisdom rather than the way of, of man. Of course, whenever we want to disagree with, with those in authority, we must also be wise about how and, and when we do that. Look at the caution we find there in verse 3. Solomon warns us, be not hasty to go from his presence, do not take your stand in an evil cause. For he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme. And who may say to him, what are you doing? Verses 3 and 4, I believe, are teaching us that, that we should not be disrespectful when we seek to disagree with those in authority over us. And of course, that's not always easy to do in practice. But think of the example of an employee who, who disagrees with his boss. He's in a meeting and, the, and they try to talk about something and he, and he gives advice. And then he just storms out of the meeting in a huff. It's not wise conduct, is it? It's foolish. We're also warned there in verse 3 not to take our stand in an evil cause. It's very easy. It can be tempting 
whenever we find ourselves under the rule of ungodly authority to rebel in an unrighteous way. But this is not the way of godly wisdom. God's people are called to fight evil and injustice with godliness. Again, I think of the example in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 3. How Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were, they were commanded to, to bow down and worship the golden image, and they refused to do so peacefully. And their peaceful stand for truth impacted that evil king, Nebuchadnezzar, for good and for God. So how are we to use wisdom in dealing with authorities? Well, there's a place, well, there is a place for obedience and for godly respect, even in how we disagree with them. Continue on in the passage we see here in verses 5 and 6, how we're encouraged by this promise of God's providential care for his people. The promise of God's providential care for his people, verses 5 and 6. He assures us there in verse 5, whoever keeps the command will know no evil thing. Obedience has the blessing of God, friends. Obedience can keep us from personal harm. First Samuel 2 and 30 promises that those who honour me, I will honour. But the wise of heart, reading on here, those who seek to walk in the way of godly wisdom will know when is the right time to oppose injustice or ungodly leadership. The preacher assures us here that the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way, verse 5. He goes on in verse 6 and something similar to what he has said in Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 1. He adds, for there is a time and there is a way for everything. I'm sure all listening in today will agree that timing is crucial in all areas of life. Think of the golfer who is playing his golf and, and he's suddenly out of form. Usually it is because he's not timing his swing or he's not, not hitting the ball at the right time. Think of the football player who, who mistimes a tackle and how he commits a, a foul which could potentially lead, lead to a penalty and lose the match for his team. Even the Prime Minister must be very careful about the time at which he calls a general election. Friends, the scriptures is teaching us here this morning that those who seek to walk in the way of God's wisdom will know the right time to be silent and the time to speak. In all of this instruction about using wisdom in dealing with authority, Solomon concedes in verses 7 to 9 the powerlessness of all mankind. The powerlessness of all mankind. You see, one of the great troubles that lies upon the heart of men is that we do not know the future. Verse 7 says that, For he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? Verse 8 goes on to say, We also do not have any power over the spirit, death, war, wickedness. No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. We're being reminded here once again, as we will later be, 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 be informed in, in chapter 12 and verse 7, that the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Earlier in chapter 3 and verse 2, the preacher is affirmed there's a time to be born and a time to die. In the New Testament, Hebrews 9 and 27 tells us it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. But friends, until that day, until the day of our death, the reality is that some people in positions of authority, as we see here in verse 9, will continue to abuse their power for their own selfish end. We have seen that even in this Last week. But in the light of such reality, the wise man or the wise woman will surely acknowledge that God alone is the ultimate ruler. God alone is the supreme authority. He is the ultimate ruler both in life and in death. And the only wise way to live is to submit to his rule in all things. Submission to the one true living God, friends, is how we walk. In the way of wisdom. Have you submitted your life to him? And to his son Jesus? You see the second thing we see in this passage here. In verse 10 through to verse 15. Is that biblical wisdom alone will ensure eternal prosperity. Biblical wisdom alone will ensure biblical, sorry, eternal prosperity. Think about what Solomon has been doing thus far. He has reflected upon the power of earthly authorities. 
He has been meditating upon God's sovereign authority over life and death. And he appears now in verse 10 to continue to reflect upon life and death. And as he does, so he sees the, the wicked buried and he asserts this is vanity. The vanity of the wicked buried. Verse 10. Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. What is he speaking about here? Well, the preacher here is outlining the futility of a funeral service in which a wicked person is praised or lauded in the very city where they committed evil deeds. You might think again of what happened on Tuesday in the city of Belfast at the funeral of an IRA terrorist and conclude that that service for one who heaped much evil during the dark days of the Troubles in Northern Ireland was but a vain insult to many people. Will that help him after death? Not unless he has repented of all his evil cynical deeds. Think about it at a more personal level. Have you ever attended a, attended a funeral service? A tribute was given to the deceased person and it was given in such a way that you wondered who actually is the minister speaking about? You see, it sometimes appears, friends, as if the wicked do not get what they deserve, even at their funerals. Look how Solomon goes on and he reinforces the vanity of injustice further in verse 14. There we read in verse 14, there is a vanity that takes place on earth. There are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. There are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said this that this also is vanity. His complaint there in verse 14 echoes the complaint of, of the psalmist Aspa in, in Psalm 73. In Psalm 73, the psalmist admits that I was envious of the arrogant whenever I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no pangs until the death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Dear friends, it is a reality, it's a sad reality that life sometimes can appear unfair. Sometimes evil people, ungodly people seem to seal through life untroubled, whilst godly people, committed followers of the Lord Jesus Christ who seek to walk in his wisdom, are beset by troubles and trials. It's a dilemma perhaps you struggle to add up in your own mind. Why do we struggle with this injustice? Well, Solomon helpfully explains there in verse 11 that it's largely due to the fact that God delays his justice. Whenever God delays punishing sin, you see, it can encourage sinners to, to rebel even more. If people think they will get away with murder, they will get away with theft, and cheating and lying and immorality and so on, they'll continue just to do that. Verse 11 teaches us there that delay in God's justice leads to even further depravity. The delay in God's justice leads to further depravity. Why is this the case? Why is God so slow? Why is he not dealing with those wicked people right now? Well, it's because of this fact, friends. The God of the Bible is a patient by God. Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6 explains that God is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Yes, justice one day will be done. Judgment will come to all wicked people, to those who reject the Saviour, to those who seek to walk in their own ways rather than the way of God. But God is a patient God and he's giving us all time to repent. Paul writes in Romans 2 and verse 4 that God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. But the truth is that many people continue to abuse God's patience and God's kindness. They go on in their sin. But one day, dear friends, be warned, they will reap what they sow. Every unrepentant sinner, Hosea 8 and 7, warns that those who sow the wind shall reap the whirlwind. Here the preacher again underlines the fact that we must keep to the forefront of our mind eternal, the eternal perspective in life and in death. 
He assures us there in verses 12 and 13 that God will make all things right in his time because God is a just God and in his justice will prevail. In verse 12 and 13 we read there that it will be well on the day of death for those who fear God but not so for the wicked. It will be well on the day of their death for those who fear God but not so for the wicked. You see after death the sins of the wicked will be counted against them. The souls of, of the unrighteous will be condemned to hell. They will be banished from God's presence forever. They'll be thrown into utter darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 8 and verse 12. So therefore can I plead with you this morning. Do not envy the apparent temporal prosperity of wicked people. The Bible teaches us that biblical wisdom alone can ensure eternal prosperity. Solomon writes there in verse 12 that it will be well with those who fear God. Friends, do you fear God? If you do, it will be well for you. The fear of God, this is a key theme in this whole book. We've come across it before. Back in chapter 3 and verse 14, we were commanded to fear God because God is sovereign over the times of life and the times of death. In chapter 5 and verse 7, we were commanded to fear God even whenever we go to worship in the house of God. Later on in chapter 12 and verse 13, we will be commanded to fear God by keeping his commandments. You see, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Proverbs 9 and verse 10. I'm sure many listening in today are familiar with the, the scene at the, at the cross of Calvary. Two thieves were crucified alongside Jesus Christ that day, one on either side of the cross. One of the thieves mocked the Saviour, but the other rebuked him. He said across to him, do you not fear God? And then this thief, he showed his own personal fear of God as he asked that the Saviour, Jesus Christ, to be his personal Saviour. And how did Jesus respond? He said, this very day, you will be with me in paradise. Friends, this is the way of wisdom. This is the way to fear God. You and I, we must ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins. We need not worry about others and what they're doing or how wicked they are. We need to examine our own hearts. We need to be wise because all sin separates us from a holy God. We will all suffer the fate of the wicked. We'll be all separated from God forever on the day of judgment unless we fear God and we ask his son Jesus to save us. Can I ask you, have you done that? Have you asked the Saviour to save you? How can we walk in the way of wisdom? Well, we see in the, in the opening nine verses we can use wisdom in dealing with authorities which ultimately means we should submit to the one true living God and his son Christ as the supreme authority in our lives. Verses 10 through to 15 teaches us that it is this type of wisdom, biblical wisdom alone, which consists of a proper fear of God that ensures eternal prosperity. And thirdly and finally note how the preacher concludes in verses 16 and 17 by reminding us of the limitations of human wisdom. The limitations of human wisdom. You see the truth is friends, no one can ever fully fathom the ways of God. No one can ever fully fathom the ways of God. Three times in verse 17 Solomon stresses this fact. That we cannot find out what is happening under the sun by human wisdom. Why is that the case? Well, it's because God's ways are so far beyond our ways. God speaks of this through Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8 and 9. There we read that my thoughts, this is God speaking, my thoughts are not your ways, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's ways are so far beyond our ways. The Apostle Paul concurs in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 11, 33, he, he writes, Oh, the depths and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his 
ways. Oh, friends, to walk in the way of wisdom, we need to realize our own limitations as human beings. We need to understand that we need to turn from our own foolish ways, stop trusting in our own righteousness, even in our own wisdom, and seek the Saviour. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7 calls us to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon while he is near. Let the wicked man forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to your God for he will abundantly pardon. I wonder will you be wise today? Will you abandon all sense of personal pride, personal wisdom? Will you stop pointing the finger at others and criticising even those in our own government who have behaved so foolishly over this past week? And will you come and trust Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God? This is how we begin to walk in the way of wisdom. And as we come to receive Christ as Saviour and Lord, then day by day he guides us through this book, the book of wisdom as to how you might live in a way befitting to be called a Christian. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you once again for your word to your hearts here today. Lord, we pray indeed that you will take the word that has been taught and you will apply it by your Holy Spirit and you will grant us all wisdom. Not only intellectual wisdom in our minds, but Father, we pray indeed that you would so move our hearts that we would embrace Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God, that we would submit to his rule in, in our lives, and we would seek by his grace to live according to the wisdom that you've given to us in your book, the infallible word of God. O oh Lord, hear our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace Smith is going to sing our closing piece. It's a lovely old piece entitled, Jesus, keep me near the cross. If you want to walk in the way of wisdom, ask Jesus to keep you near the cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There I pray to
Now to him who is able to strengthen us according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith, to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen.